Uh, let's begin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to what should be an important and well-timed discussion. Uh, my name is Neil Irwin. I'm a senior economic correspondent at the New York Times. I'm also senior advisor for the Initiative for Economic Policy here at Columbia Business School. Uh, we were all set to launch this semester with several live events on economic policy. Uh, of course, like the entire rest of the world, we've gone virtual, and so we're excited to participate in this event. Uh, I'm also an alum of Columbia Business School. I earned an MBA in 2008. Uh, this event is brought to you by the Chase Institute for Global Business uh, and the uh, Initiative for Economic Policy. Uh, I would invite you, as we proceed, to type questions in the Q&A feature here in Zoom. Uh, we'll make this conversation as interactive as possible, given the technological limitations. Uh, the, the economic relationship between China and the United States uh, was already profoundly important, deeply complex, uh, even fraught in a lot of ways, even before the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the world's two largest economies have become deeply interdependent, deep trade and financial ties, uh, and yet with also some amount of friction over those ties, as we saw with the trade wars that uh, captured headlines for most of the last two years. Even before the coronavirus crisis, there were open questions about how that relationship would evolve between these two superpowers, uh, how they need to evolve for the 21st century, and what that relationship might look like in the decades ahead. I think all those questions are in even starker relief uh, amid this, uh, this crisis. I'm tremendously excited by uh, the conversation we're about to have today. Our guest is uh, Shang Jun Wei. He is the N.T. Wang Professor of Chinese Business and Economy at Columbia Business School. He's also a Chazen Senior Scholar. From 2014 to 2016, Dr. Wei was Chief Economist at the Asian Development Bank. Uh, before coming to Columbia in 2007, he was Chief of the Trade and Investment Division at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Dr. Wei studied the complexities of globalization and China's role in the world economy for his entire career. He's published several uh, numerous widely cited uh, pieces of work on subjects in international economics. Uh, we're, uh, thank you for being here, Dr. Wei. Um, why don't we start before uh, COVID-19? Uh, it seems like uh, uh, 10 years ago, but it was only about two months ago. Uh, if we were having this conversation in January, uh, how would you describe the, the, the evolving relationship between the US and China? How things, as the trade war had a bit of a de-escalation uh, where were we positioned before this crisis? Before the crisis, the, the bilateral relationship was at a at, at a fork. It could go, you know, better or go worse, depending very much on the two government, uh, uh, you know, positions they will uh, take. I think it it depended more on the U.S. positions than on, on Chinese position. Then in uh, in uh, now, uh, you know, it could go worse uh, if. Uh, uh, somehow, uh, uh, you know, one decides that having more tension serves uh, domestic uh, political purposes. But you know, if the two governments decide that they are away, then we might see a deterioration of the relationship. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, if uh, uh, the two sides think uh, uh, cooperation uh, serves the two countries' interests better, we'll see more of more of that. So, how do you interpret uh, since this crisis has emerged? We've seen different phases of things. At some points, President Trump has wanted to blame China for this and, and make this a point of tension in the relationship. At others, uh, he has kind of backed away from that. Uh, the U.S. is importing lots of medical equipment and, and uh, pharmaceuticals from China. Uh, how, in this moment of crisis, how has that uh, environment changed? The global community, I think there's a much stronger need for uh, collaboration between these two countries as well as with other uh, countries. Uh, but uh, cooperation might not necessarily the inevitable uh, outcome uh, again because you know it's an election year uh, in the US uh, and uh, you know uh, of course Chinese government also uh, have need to maintain uh, you know a, a domestic uh, a political position so uh, uh, you know if if, if uh, governments decide it's politically useful to have tension. You, we might have seen, you know, we may see more uh, more tension. So the outcome is is less uh, less uh, certain. Um, uh, based on uh, past uh, experience, however, whenever a uh, U.S. is in economic or social difficulties, often you will see stronger voice uh, arguing for cooperation. That was the case with 9-11 terrorist uh, attack, and it was also the case uh, with global financial uh, crisis. Uh, that's because uh, you know, the policies uh, aim at uh, economic recovery uh, tends to have a better chance to succeed uh, if we have international cooperation. So, so there is a, a voice for cooperation. And in fact, I think uh, there's a recent uh, uh, 
uh, open statement, a public statement, uh, calling for stronger bilateral co cooperation, signed by uh, many high-level former government officials uh, from both Republican and Democratic administrations. So that's consistent with my logic that uh, uh, times of crisis uh, tend to be times calling for cooperation. But whether this will translate into some advice that the uh, uh, current administration will heed is something that we have to wait and see. So does this uh, call into any question the, the model of international global supply chains that's evolved over the last few decades where, you know, intermediate goods ship between different countries uh, in East Asia, eventually bound for the U.S. or Europe? Um, is, is, is there reason to question that form of globalization, given uh, every kind of country is looking inward right now? There are certainly voices that are calling for, you know, rethinking about global uh, supply chains. I want to first uh, uh, note, uh, not only we live in an area of global supply chains, which, which is everywhere, but both China and United States are important nodes. They are uh, among the most important nodes uh, in global supply chains for many, many sectors. For example, uh, you know, China has been the most important foreign auto parts uh, and component supply to U.S. Uh, automobile uh, in the industry. And, uh, and, and similarly, uh, U.S. Uh, supply the inputs and parts and components are also crucial uh, for Chinese uh, 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 production. So supply chains are important. Global supply chains are important for both, both economies. Um, uh, the pandemic, of course, has uh, raised, uh, you know, some people are asking for, were asking for decoupling uh, in the U.S., before the pandemic, and now uh, with the uh, shortage of uh, uh, PPEs, um, many uh, thought that uh, you know uh, maybe there's even more reason to, uh, to 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 call for decoupling. Decoupling meaning uh, getting U.S. production to be less dependent on uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, supplies. But I was uh, I will say it's not obvious that the de decoupling uh, will uh, 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 speed speed up. Uh, in the short run, ironically, the pandemic, I think, make it even harder to engineer a decoupling because most firms are facing weakening uh, financial conditions. And, and, and relocating supply chain costs a lot of money. And this is not a time when firms want to think about new investments. So, so I think the pandemic, if there were a momentum for decoupling, pandemic uh, will give a, give a pause to that, number one. Number two, of course, over, over, over the long term, once the pandemic is... Uh, passes, company decisions will go back to long-term fundamentals, and some firms will, uh, international firms will uh, relocate supply chains out of China, uh, not necessarily because they are heeding to some government uh, call for decoupling, but because of rising labor cost, changing competitive advantage of China makes some of the supply chains less cost-effective in China. But their logic would mean other supply chains will relocate into China, may very well expand uh, because, uh, you know, China's uh, new competitive advantage might mean you know, China is able to be the most efficient producers in some uh, mid-level mid technology uh, um, um, products. Um, the, the uh, you know, the, the, uh, the national security part of the U.S. Uh, operation might uh, want to argue for more uh, de decoupling. That's not something that can be uh, easily uh, done because most U.S. companies recognize the true competitors for them are German firms, Japanese firms, British firms, and they are not Chinese firms. Uh, and, and if uh, you know other countries or U.S. firms competitors use uh, Chinese supplies as, as the least cost, the least uh, you know most cost effective uh, uh, supplies, U.S. companies will lose global uh, market shares if they, if they do uh, relocation or decoupling. Uh, uh, you know, against uh, against uh, cost uh, uh, calculation. What we are more likely to see uh, is uh, this reinforcement, of, you know, what is called China plus one, China plus two kind of a strategy that you, you want to combine, you know, efficiency is not the only thing you want to, the pandemic has reminded us that we want to pay uh, some attention to resilience and robustness as well as uh, efficiency. So we're more likely to see, you know, China plus one, China plus two kind of a strategy in increasing number of sectors rather than simply uh, decoupling. Well, it's an interesting point that this could uh, kind of align with, with President Xi's longer term economic strategy of going higher up the value chain, more technologically complex products, uh, getting out of the kind of low wage, uh, you know, factory to the world economic model 
Uh, could you see this this kind of accelerating that shift that was already underway? Some of the uh, so-called so moving up the value chains is a natural outcome of uh, changing fundamentals, right? Just with, you know, uh, the, precisely because the past 40 years of economic development in China was relatively successful, you have very rapid increasing uh, wage, wage rate. In fact, no country has produced a higher rate of wage growth uh, 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 than, than, uh, than China. But that's good for Chinese workers, but it also means many things that used to be uh, most cost effective uh, in China is no longer so. Uh, you know, India, uh, for example, has almost the same size uh, of workforce as China, again, with only one third of the uh, labor cost. You know, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh all have very large populations, you know, 100 million or more. Uh, have much uh, with much lower uh, wages, so by necessity, China have to move, move up. Firm have to move up their value uh, value uh, chains. You know whether or not government calls for it. Some of the government's effort to try to speed speed up the process, I think, could be counter uh, uh, counterproductive. That if you are if you are trying if you try to move to uh, you know technology uh, levels that China does not really have a, a, a strong uh, edge, you might waste resources. And we have a lot of examples uh, like that. So, so I think uh, uh, you know, much of the change is just natural process of uh, higher wage uh, and, uh, and evolving computer advantage. Um, you know, government can help in some areas, uh, but not every piece of a government program is necessarily productive, in my view. So how, how is this crisis affecting uh, China's geopolitical ambitions and economic ambitions across Asia, Africa, the Belt and Road Initiative, this desire to be a, a true world power that, that has roles uh, all over the world? Uh, is some of that ambition being escalated or pulled back, do you think, as, as this plays out? Um, so the before the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, 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 Probably for for six or seven years or so, uh, Ch Chinese global ambition uh, in economic and commercial area uh, was best represented by two things. One is the One Belt One Road uh, program, and the other is internationalization of uh, a Chinese uh, currency. I would say, you know, the the the, the, the two important uh, background reasons for for that kind of ambition need to be keep in mind. Right? You know, one uh, uh, you know one 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 is. Um, you know, the U.S. has been arguing, uh, the U.S. administration at the time uh, had been calling for China uh, to be a responsible stakeholder. That phrase turns out to permit multiple interpretations. But uh, it, it was heard uh, in Beijing is a request to play a greater role. Now, the, the reason U.S. had this was because out, coming out of a global financial crisis, U.S. want, uh, you know, looking around the world and, look, and, and, and was looking for countries they can have aggressive macro stimulus, which would be good for U.S., which would raise the demand for U.S. products, help U.S. to recover. In, uh, in that uh, time, uh, China perhaps was the only large country that was fiscally feasible to do something uh, like that. China was, uh, was experiencing relatively mild uh, consequences of the global financial crisis. Uh, and, and so that's, there was one background information that the global community was asking for China to play a greater uh, role. And China probably interpreted this a bit uh, uh, too broadly. And the second important background information was China was sitting on $4 trillion worth of foreign exchange uh, reserve or foreign, foreign uh, assets. These uh, foreign assets were earning extremely low returns in dollar term and possibly negative returns in IMB terms. So they were looking for diversification out of simply holding U.S. Treasury bills to do something else. Uh, yeah, in their, uh, against their background, the One Bell One uh, Road program investing in infrastructure in other countries looks like a very low cost uh, 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 option. It, you know, you don't really the, the opportunity cost is very low, um, and so these are uh, these are two important uh, background uh, uh, information underlying the the previous wave of Chinese uh, uh, global ambition. All of those things have changed. I think three change, uh, changes have taken place that suggest that China may very well scale down its global uh, ambition, right? So, so, so number one, we see a lot of pushbacks from other countries 
both on the one by one uh, road programs and on the internationalization of IMDs. Not all the pushbacks necessarily reasonable uh, or fair, but nonetheless, it gives Beijing a signal that uh, there's strong pushback uh, on, on this, and number one. And number two, a Chinese uh, falling uh, uh, asset position is much smaller today uh, than, uh, than uh, eight or nine uh, years ago. Uh, that also, uh, uh, you know, will cause some uh, uh, re rethinking. And, and, and number three, um, you know, the pandemic uh, itself might also play a role in, uh, in, the, in the context of pandemic. Many have called on um, China to give, uh, you know, to offer a debt forgiveness uh, or um, at least the moratorium of a debt uh, payment that will reduce the returns on Chinese foreign asset uh, uh, deployment. China is still a uh, middle-income country, much poorer than than uh, uh, U.S. So, so, so debt relief and debt uh, uh, moratorium, which is so globally useful thing to do and probably necessary, but uh, but of course it, uh, it also translates into lower returns on uh, uh, Chinese uh, foreign uh, foreign uh, assets. All of those, all of those things, I think, will contribute to some rethinking uh, in, in, in Beijing and, and, and may very well lead to some scaling back of those uh, ambitions in the near term. Yeah, there's, there are arguments that, that if anything, that the prominence and role of the dollar in the global financial system is being enhanced by this. The Federal Reserve has done these foreign currency swaps as being kind of the global lender of last resort. Meanwhile, the Chinese do not seem inclined to liberalize their capital accounts uh, uh, it sounds like uh, you, you're not seeing a more prominent role of, of renminbi in the, in the global financial system coming out. Of well, I would note that, uh, you know, there, there are certainly uh, uh, sub areas, at least, uh, where, where uh, you will continue to see uh, some expansion of IMB uh, role uh, in the international system. So swaps won't be one example. To the extent uh, uh, countries in financial difficulty uh, would uh, tend to have, uh, you know, demand for uh, more swaps. If you can get swaps with U.S. Federal Reserve, they will do do that. If not, uh, swaps with a other uh, central banks that are able to offer those things. And uh, uh, Chinese central bank uh, is a prominent example in that uh, area. They will do that. So I will be I won't be surprised to see more swap agreements uh, involving uh, uh, involving IMB. Uh, that's certainly uh, uh, one uh, one area we might see some uh, uh, some uh, movement. And China was not going to formally forego uh, internationalization uh, of uh, uh, IMB. In terms of capital account liberalization, uh, we need to be, uh, 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 be careful a little bit. China actually is making progress on uh, capital account liberalization in many, uh, in many uh, areas. Capital account liberalization is not a zero one choice. So there are many areas in which uh, uh, one can have restrictions or not have restrictions on tra financial transactions between Chinese residents uh, and, and overseas uh, uh, residents. Uh, for 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 example, um, uh, you know, in the in the equity market, for example, China had uh, uh, several ways of, of internationalization. There has been strengthening of the uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Shenzhen Stock Exchange uh, uh, Connect program, and they may be looking to ways to 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 have a similar program with Tokyo Stock Exchange. Strength, strengthening a program they started with London uh, on a very small scale, but it may look be looking for ways to to expand this. We're going to see progress on this, and there are also many more licenses offering to foreign financial institutions to be active in uh, China. I believe uh, a few months ago, uh, Chinese uh, government have removed the investment ceiling on uh, what's called the uh, qualified foreign institutional investors, foreign invest, uh, you know, UBS, Goldman Sachs, and so used to have a license with a dollar ceiling on how much they can invest in China, those ceiling have been removed, which means they can invest uh, any amount that they, they, they desire. So all of those are, you know, there's accumulation of many small steps that are in the direction of uh, making current account more convertible. I, I, I do not expect to see uh, the country to go back on, on, on those. Um, you know, the, the trade wars uh, coming into this year uh, you know, what, the big issue was uh, kind of technology transfer and, and alleged allegations of technology theft by Chinese companies kind of aided by the government. Um, you know, that's, that was a very fraught, difficult thing in the trade negotiations. Uh, is, is that issue going, any, going away? I mean, there was a sense of phase one trade deal. Okay, we're going to put that aside. 
Um, uh, but it seems like that is not the type of issue that goes away if you're a if you're an American or European company that wants to do business in China but does not want your intellectual property to be to be taken. I will note a few things. First of all, uh, 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 clearly China has a lot of a scope uh, for improvement uh, uh, in strengthening uh, intellectual property rights and um, protection. And IP protection is a, is a work in progress uh, in China. That's the first thing I will note. The second thing I will note uh, is that uh, on, on the other hand, uh, if one has the impression, one often has the impression by reading, uh, you know, uh, media reports or hearing. White House pronouncement that China has a uniquely bad problem with IP protection. That, that impression, in fact, is not quite consistent with uh, facts and data. I have looked at the, you know, it's a very hard to measure strength of uh, IP protection. Ask, uh, you know, lawyers in, in, in intellectual property rights uh, area, and many lawyers in New York and uh, elsewhere uh, 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 tell me that, uh, you know, much of the problem is, is reflects the fact that China is very large. So you have a lot of business transactions with China. Uh, and it's a middle-income country. You have problems associated with middle, uh, middle, uh, middle-income countries, just like you have problem IP problems with uh, Indian firms, IP problems with Mexican firms, because they are just you know ha- have a less developed uh, overall uh, institutional uh, you know legal environment, regulatory uh, uh, environment. Um, in fact, around the uh, across the world, the, perhaps the single best predictor of how well a country's IP uh, regime is, is a country's income level. And China actually follows their rule. So, so one particular area where one can get data, which I have done, uh, is to look at uh, um, a country's royalty payment and licensing fee, licensing fee uh, payment to foreign patent and IP holders. That's an objective number you can get uh, from balance of payment account. Uh, then number around the world is skilled by GDP is strongly positively associated with GDP per capita. That is, as a country gets bigger, you tend to see more uh, our payment of licensing fees, royalties to foreign, uh, foreign uh, IP holders. Uh, China follows their rules. So Chinese uh, uh, payment on this rises very fast over time in line with its income level. It's certainly not a country where you know, if you get the impression that this is a country that only take a foreign IP without compensation, you will see no payment or very little payment. In fact, the amount of IP payment to foreign license holders by Chinese firm is essentially in line with with international uh, international norm, empirical norm based on cross country patterns. Because Chinese income has been rising very fast, that means Chinese royalty and license fee payment to foreign IP holders also has been rising fast, much, much faster than virtually any other country uh, you can think of, just because Chinese growth rate has been much, much faster than, than uh, other countries. And the third point I would, uh, I would note uh, is that the, 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 uh, Chinese uh, firms and government seems to recognize the importance of strengthening IP protection. A very good reason for this is that 20 or 20 years ago, when we talk about strengthening IP protection, it usually means a transfer from Chinese firms to multi- multinational firms. So IP protection is essentially for the good of other countries. But today, because many more Chinese firms have become more innovative, many more Chinese firms have applied and received patents, um, the IP protection also means protection the, the intellectual property rights of the Chinese uh, firms. So there's a lot of domestic uh, demand for strengthening uh, IP regime. I think from the, in the end, this is going to be the most important fundamental force. They will say that we, sh- we will expect to see stronger and stronger IP protection. Fascinating. Um, uh, I again invite anyone to, uh, to enter a question in the Q&A feature in Zoom. I'll turn to those questions in a moment. Uh, just quickly, uh, what so what is the uh, Chinese role in the WTO and kind of the trade governance system that the world has has had for for decades now? Uh, has has the Trump administration kind of blown that out of the water, or is the framework for uh, U.S. China trade relations going to continue to go through these multinational organizations and uh, multilateral agreements? So uh, both, I would first note that both United States uh, and China are important beneficiaries of global trading system, the rule-based global trading system. The WTO uh, uh, represents the, you know, the important node in this trading system where uh, disputes among uh, member countries are adjudicated through a process 
at the WTO set up or led by US, set up by 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 United States. You know, WTO rules. I I, I should note for a few people who may not be aware of this, uh, as uh, you know, uh, the outcome of international negotiation led by the US and China plays no role in it because WTO was set up in 1995 before China uh, was a member. So the, the, so the rules essentially were imposed on new members. So China had to accept it, the, the rules. Uh, periodically, WTO will review how new members comply with the, uh, with, uh, with the rules. Now, of course, you know, if you read those documents, of course, no country has a perfect record. Let's be uh, clear on this. So China does not have a perfect record. However, the, the reviews also says China is not unusual. Uh, just uh, the, the um, uh, in fact, if we, if we have um, any confidence uh, in market-based economy, uh, the, the point I'm going to make next is not really surprising. So much of the, uh, the, the Chinese economic success uh, following the accession uh, to the WTO is because the, the, those rules and accession agreement have forced China to do various kind of a pro-market reforms, and China have done it. So China, China grow because it made those reforms, not because it resi resisted those reforms. If China had resisted those reforms, completely escaped those obligations, China would be like, like North Korea or Cuba. It would not be, not, would not be uh, a, a economic uh, success story. So the economic success comes precisely from uh, more or less doing the reforms that WTO accession has asked China uh, to, uh, to uh, do. Now, the one uh, key component of the WTO dispute mechanism uh, is this, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of the Supreme Court within the global trading system, a nine-judge appellate court that adjudicates the uh, adjudicates uh, uh, disputes. The U.S. didn't quite. The, 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 this, this system was set up by coalition of country led by the U.S. and U.S. always, even though there, there are only nine judges, I believe U.S. always has. At least one judge uh, on the uh, on the panel. So there's no sense in which this is a system that buys in favor of China against the U.S. There's no uh, no that. Of course, the, uh, all of those systems can be improved upon, and there's I think uh, you know a good reason to think why uh, WTO is not perfect. Uh, but uh, U.S. Uh, has chosen to essentially kill the appellate body by refusing to. So the appellate body judge has has a term, a few years of term. So Every few years or so, you have you have to have new judges being appointed, and U.S. have chosen to deny appointment of any new judges when an existing term uh, expires, rendering the dispute settlement mechanisms uh, uh, not functional, which is very unfortunate, I think, uh, because the, the system has served both U.S. and China and other countries uh, well, uh, and, and U.S. certainly uh, 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 does not have less voice in the system than uh, any other uh, other countries. I'm hoping that uh, uh, you know there will be a recognition of this in time within the U.S. political system. The U.S. can exercise leadership again and to, to and, and then organize WTO reform in a much more productive way than than just killing killing the dispute um, uh, settlement mechanism. Great. Um, I'll now turn to uh, to some questions. Um, there are some hawkish voices in the United States, uh, Senator Tom Cotton among them, uh, who suggested a number of ways that, that the United States might penalize China in the short term for its behavior on the Wuhan virus uh, and uh, potentially boycotting the Olympics, uh, uh, full diplomatic relations with Taiwan, restricting Chinese students from studying the sciences in the U.S. Uh, what, what probability do you assign to, to some of this uh, kind of potential for aggressive uh, diplomatic response, and uh, is that something we should think of as a as a real kind of risk factor in this in this evolving relationship? Well, some of the things the uh, U.S. probably can do, Congress can do on its own, uh, and they probably will do uh, do it. Pandemic certainly provides a good uh, 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 you know uh, to do a side pandemic as a reason to to do this. Others probably uh, are, are no go. I mean. Uh, uh, is non, non starter So, so uh, um, ag, uh, asking for asking China for financial compensation, I think, is, is one area where uh, it's very unlike has no uh, uh, legal basis for that because uh, because of the doctrine of sovereign immunity. But even morally, I think, uh, uh, and uh, uh, practically, uh, it would be hard for US um, to do because there were. So, so uh, let me first note that uh, that uh, clearly the. 
the initial suppression of information uh, in Wuhan uh, was making things uh, uh, worse. Uh, and it, it is interest uh, in uh, global community as well as in China to to make sure uh, science uh, should dominate and that there should be um, uh, uh, transparency uh, in those uh, matters. It's very, uh, very uh, clear. But the principle of having the, the initial uh, country of the trouble compensating the other country uh, it will, will be very troublesome, even for, for, for US. Uh, for, for example, uh, you know, global financial crisis started uh, in the US, arguably after successive deliberate deregulation by US Congress, right? So that, 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 that caused a mismatch uh, of uh, uh, large financial institutions uh, incentive and, and conduct in the US that, that caused tremendous uh, you know, uh, loss of uh, not just wealth in other countries, and no countries uh, are there you know, because of falling household uh, income, uh, many households couldn't afford medicines and, uh, and, uh, and healthcare, and potentially people uh, may also have died unnecessarily from a global global financial uh, crisis. So those principle of composition, I think, will be will, uh, will, it's not obviously in U.S. Uh, uh, own uh, interest. Plus, uh, there were previous uh, pandemic, you know, AIDS pandemic started in the U.S. H one N one. Uh, started in the U.S. that didn't uh, necessarily. We didn't, I don't think we we we, we had uh, a a lockdown of New York City or lockdown of Los Angeles to prevent the uh, uh, you know uh, those uh, viruses from uh, going uh, going abroad. I don't I don't think uh, uh, there were uh, a compensation uh, scheme offered. So those things were were were, were non starter but you know, but there are other things you know, that, that essentially does not require international cooperation that U.S. probably will do it. Uh, uh, can do it uh, anyway. Uh, whether this is the right, most productive thing for U.S. to do or not, you know, that's uh, uh, you know that's a, a, a judgment call. I see um, the pandemic demonstrates even greater need for for uh, for uh, collaboration between the two countries, collaboration among the you know community of, of nations. In the short run, for example, we need more joint effort, not, not less. Uh, effort in developing uh, vaccines. Uh, over the long run, you know, there are many problems in the world whose solution requires uh, uh, collaboration. You know, uh, climate change, perhaps the uh, most important challenge uh, that that is facing the uh, world uh, community, and no effective solution uh, can uh, uh, you know uh, can take place without uh, uh, either effort of the U.S. or effort of, effort of China. So, so, uh, so, so we have to put everything in, the, in this larger context. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, could you talk about how you foresee things evolving with the, the wariness that the United States has for Chinese acquisitions of U.S. assets after the pandemic? We've seen some, some kind of pushback on uh, Chinese investments in the U.S. Uh, how could COVID-19 affect those concerns? You uh, Chinese investment in China, in the US. Yes, yes. They, they, I mean, there there were uh, of course uh, uh, pushback on this even before the uh, before the uh, pandemic. So the, the, the my reading of this is the so the background of uh, you know why China uh, was investing so much uh, uh, in the US and other country uh, has to do uh, uh, partly with the early discussion about the one belt one road program as well. So China had been accumulating a lot of falling assets, earning very low returns uh, in U.S. Uh, government uh, securities. So also there was an effort to diversify uh, into something that uh, that's, uh, you know, that would have higher returns, higher, higher at least uh, uh, long-term uh, returns. There was one bad one. And the other bad one is there were uh, many uh, increasingly more uh, rich entrepreneurs uh, in China who, make money, uh, who have made money from their business uh, in China or, or uh, uh, elsewhere, they want to diversify their uh, asset allocation, and U.S. looks like a, a good place uh, to 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 uh, place their uh, uh, wealth. So there was that uh, effort. The pushback uh, was the concern. Uh, one was the IP protection; the other was national security consideration. The third is using uh, either of the two uh, is the excuse to 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 prevent the competitors uh, abroad. The U.S. Uh, uh, national security review process of Chinese investment, I want to note something that's probably not always uh, noted, have effectively raised the price that Chinese uh, acquirers of U.S. assets have to pay. And ask lawyers to, to give some estimates, you know, it's very hard to 
estimate is precisely, but my guesstimate is the Chinese firm uh, uh, end up having to pay perhaps 15% more for their assets uh, than otherwise the case, which is in fact is a, a, form, a form of expropriation that you actually uh, would design a system that has a nice sounding rationale, but end up having the Chinese acquirers to transfer 15% more wealth uh, to U.S. assets. So that's probably good for the U.S. Uh, companies uh, in the end, but it, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, it, but it is a form of a, a uh, form of expropriation. The, um, uh, so I, 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 I talked to uh, both lawyers and investors, but I understand that. So, so they are, they are uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds and other uh, uh, investors who are uh, uh, both more, uh, you know, aware of the uh, pushback back in the U.S., but also are concerned with the investment feeling. They worry about, you know, if you, if you leave the assets in the U.S., you know, could U.S., Someday, just taking over those assets without compensation. It's 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 a it's a not a high uh, risk uh, event uh, uh, in the U.S., but one can never rule out uh, in, a, in an environment where um, America first may be interpreted in a very narrow uh, narrow way. So, I, uh, so one thing that I, I understand the the, uh, the Chinese sovereign wealth fund are trying to do is to never be a majority holder always partner with the U.S. investment fund, so they will become a passive investor. The, the, the purpose of doing this is to, to, to essentially offer uh, you know, a, a, a dimension of assurance to, 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 to U.S. Uh, uh, um, political uh, and commercial environment that, that the Chinese investment will not be the, the major investment. So they have a lot of attempts to do that, and I think they talk about setting, setting up a Rust Belt fund to invest uh, in, uh, in in the Rust Belt uh, areas of the U.S. to you know, so hopefully it will be generating employment locally, generating uh, tax revenue uh, uh, in the U.S. and at the same time not being the majority uh, investor. So so I don't know. I, I imagine we might see more of those kind of investments uh, going forward. Uh, another question. You you mentioned the need for companies to consider resiliency and robustness in addition to efficiency. But will stockholders and publicly traded companies who are seeing their stock values nosedive sit still for the necessary investment in resiliency and robustness? Are companies ready to do the make the kind of changes that this next era of globalization might require? You talk about companies from which countries? No, in general, okay. Well, I mean, certainly, the you know the in in, in, in the last uh, twenty or thirty years, you know, much of the emphasis has been on efficiency, efficiency. So much of the offshoring uh, uh, has been on cost. Saving. Let's look for the least cost producer and just outsource that part of the work uh, to that uh, firm. The pandemic ta uh, taught us that the long term efficiency. If you want, you want to, you, one does not want to think about efficiency in the static sense. We have to think about dynamic long-term efficiency. Resilience is an important part of it uh, as well. That you know, you know sometimes it, it pays to have uh, you know uh, uh, perhaps a portfolio of, of, of a supplies, several supplies rather than one supply, rather than the least cost supplies. Perhaps you want to have least cost supplies, second lowest cost supplies located in different parts of the world, so that when you have a, a shock to one supplier, you will not uh, you know you will not uh, just have your uh, production completely shut down. This, is, this doesn't just come from the pandemic uh, uh, episode. So, so the previous, uh, I think the Japanese um, uh, earthquake, the, 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 the tsunami event, uh, also taught us that, lot, that lesson on a much smaller scale at the time. Uh, many of the key uh, global uh, auto part supplies came from a particular region in Japan. So for a, while, for a few months, for example, you, you might recall that, uh, that there's a time when the, the global auto production had to ha, have to slow down. There's also, I think that there's a particular paint. It turns out an ingredient to a particular uh, paint going into automobiles for the entire world came from one particular factory in Japan. And we actually recognize that, uh, you know, that, that uh, you know, we don't have enough uh, resilience to those, uh, to those shocks. I think the pandemic, of course, reminds us uh, of this uh, risk on a much larger scale, so that I think uh, many more companies could rethink about their corporate strategies to add more weight uh, on, on resilience consideration than uh, than just the cost uh, cost saving consideration. 
Um, what do you see as the investment environment for private equity and venture capital, how it might evolve after uh, Huawei and COVID? Uh, is there a tendency for the Chinese government to be more aggressive in making investments, particularly in industries such as semiconductors? Uh, there, are, there are two pieces uh, uh, to that uh, question. The one um, from the private sector uh, point of view, so all the private sector investors always, uh, you know, do uh, you know, recal- recalibration about what is the new competitive advantage and what is the uh, the, the kind of a transformation uh, taking place in various countries. So, for example, let me start with like a U.S. investor looking at uh, 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 looking at China, and they see a few uh, uh, tendencies. You know, one is even before the pandemic, China was moving more towards a consumption-based economy. So you have lots of uh, new investment uh, opportunities coming from catering towards their uh, uh, rising need for consumption. And then you can also see uh, more uh, uh, Chinese uh, firm becomes more innovative by necessity, you know, responding to to uh, to uh, rising labor costs. They have to uh, be more innovative. And that also opens up a, a, a set of uh, investable opportunities for international uh, private equity and PE uh, funds. The, the pandemic have, uh, in a way, reinforced some of those. For example, within the consumption space, uh, online business, uh, online uh, education uh, firms uh, uh, become much more attractive. And certainly in the te- technology space, you know, uh, China is also uh, you know, one of the countries that are active in in uh, mid-level medical technology uh, firms, uh, in medical imaging uh, firms, and, and certainly PPE. PPEs are most of the PPEs are low tech, uh, uh, low tech uh, 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 industry that, that, that China has many uh, firms. The, the PPE yeah. p- supplies themselves may not be very interesting investment uh, 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 targets because it's very it's a very competitive uh, industry. But I think the mid tech. Um, you know, medical device uh, and, and, and medical uh, care f- uh, firms uh, could be in, uh, interesting uh, investment targets. I'm sure many PVC firms are looking at those uh, opportunities. And U.S. cost the, uh, the, the same thing. So there are Chinese investors looking at the U.S., looking at the European um, uh, area. They're going to pay attention to potentially newly emerging opportunities in the on- online space medical technology and, and, and other things that you know, allow people to connect uh, connect better uh, without re- relying on you know physical travel physical meetings and so on another question do you, do you view China's handling of the pandemic uh, both the domestic aspects and the international uh, dimensions as having an impact on on the party's rule uh, do you believe it could give voice to, to critics or pose serious threats to Xi's authority? So um, in the initial phase, when uh, it was clear that the Wuhan government was suppressing information, there was a, a widespread uh, anger uh, on the you know WeChat and social media uh, in uh, uh, in China. I think that the, the uh, central government has successfully, more or less successfully, isolated uh, this problem to be a Wuhan only problem. So the so the head of uh, Wuhan city and head of uh, Hubei province, where Wuhan. Is, is located, both have lost uh, uh, lost, lost uh, jobs. In a subsequent uh, uh, lockdown, uh, 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 measures have been very aggressive. So, so it's been, uh, you know, unlike what, uh, you know, the White House uh, press conference was very surprised by uh, how low the Chinese inflation uh, cases were as a share of the population. So the, so the narrative there is, is it's probably just the outcome of, of a fake uh, data. Uh, I know many um, uh, uh, Chinese in- intellectuals you know, who either have degrees from U.S. institution or visited the U.S. Uh, from time to time. They normally can, uh, can be very skeptical about government uh, data, but very few people doubt about inflation data reported in China sub- uh, you know, uh, subsequent to this. I think because they, you know, if you live in Beijing and Shanghai, you can see and feel how aggressive those contact tracing lockdown measures were. And they, they, they just, uh, they, f- from their point of view, I think very few Chinese were surprised by the low inflation case. I think the, the nature of this, essentially China has managed to make the uh, COVID-19 be a Hubei-only problem rather than a national um, problem. Uh, and and, and that, that's the main reason for the very low inflation um, uh, uh, case, uh, case number compared to the US, uh, Italy, and, and Spain. 
that fact, so the fact that the other countries were not quite successful, uh, were, 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 were too late in starting the, 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 the lockdown or, or shelter in the home kind of a measure, uh, make the Chinese uh, uh, pandemic control look relatively more successful. So that, ironically, I think they will uh, very likely will strengthen the, 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 the central government hold in the society rather than weaken it. Uh, uh, but the call for greater transparency is still there. Uh, you know, we certainly will uh, hope that they will uh, they will uh, uh, stay uh, certainly in the uh, at least in the public health area, which, which uh, you know the, the uh, those call for transparency will will stay. But uh, you know, if the rest of the world were more successful uh, in, in 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 containing the pandemic, you know, we might see a different picture. But at this moment, uh, I, yeah, I I don't think uh, this is a threat to the to, to the government's control. Um, so just one or two more and then we'll, we'll wind down. Um, Professor, how would, a, how would a change of party in the United States presidency uh, help or affect the U.S.-China relationship uh, on economics in terms of trade, currency, uh, China's commodity consumption, and, and it's shift up the value chain? Uh, how does this all change if we have President Biden a year from now? No, we don't know. We have to, uh, we have to wait and uh, see. You know, there's uh, so, so certainly the demand um stronger IP, lower trade barrier, and so on. I think this will uh, con continue. Um, uh, but uh, the way one manages uh, bilateral relationship uh, can be more, more uh, can be uh, different. Uh, hopefully, with more productive ways. Uh, you know, the the way I think the trade war was managed uh, from from the US was not uh, uh, necessarily productive, right? So the, uh, say the phase one agreement embeds many measures. Uh, the phase one agreement that doesn't uh, automatically put China on a path towards more market-oriented economic models. You know, many measures in the phase one agreement explicitly ask China to use non-market measures. An example of this would be uh, having China to, uh, to have government orders to divert the uh, imports away from other countries towards U.S. agricultural products and other products. They are explicit non-market non or anti-market measures. So that sort of put China uh, on, 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 on a wrong, uh, in a wrong direction. So hopefully the uh, 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 you know, um, U.S. will have a different approach. Uh, whichever uh, government uh, in um, power, mm -hmm. uh, they will uh, uh, ensure whatever, you know, um, Supply chain management or trade agree, trade negotiations will be consistent of encouraging China to continue on a path to be more market oriented. Well, um, we'll make this the last question. Wind down. I'm sure everyone has uh, things to do. Um, I, this is for me, and it's uh, a little more kind of big picture. You know, when you think about how major economies uh, have related over the over the decades, there are a lot of different versions of that, and. Uh, there, you know, the United States and Japan were, were very large economies that were very good allies and have been for uh, you know, ever since the end of World War II. Uh, the U.S. and Britain have been close allies, even as this kind of superpower status migrated across the Atlantic. Uh, but then there's also the Cold War. There's the U.S. and, and Soviet Union during the Cold War era. Um, if, if, if you had to guess, if we have this conversation in 10 or 20 years, does this relationship look more like... Uh, the U.S. and Japan, or more like the U.S. and the Soviet Union? Is this is can this be a kind of close allied relationship, or are these fissures too great to be overcome, even with the passage of time? There's certainly a danger for the bilateral relationship to move towards the Cold War type relationship. I want to note the following thing, uh, you know, uh, uh, from 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 the data. The U.S. Uh, uh, was a unquestioned the global uh, hegemonic power after World War Two. Uh, all the way to to now, it's not just uh, because U.S. has been the largest economy in the world. It's also because the gap between U.S. and the second largest economy has been very, very large. The the, the last time when uh, another economy that was getting somewhat close to to match with U.S. was Japan in 1980s. This happened also to be a time when we see a lot of uh, Japan bashing news articles, government pronouncement, and so on, right? And I think it's probably not entirely co coincidental. You look at the Japan's GDP as a share of US GDP. In 1980s, that percentage is roughly the same as Chinese share today, right? So, so, so I think uh, 
in, in, in unlike Japan, whose uh, relative size to, to U.S. declined afterwards. Most likely, unless China had disastrous uh, uh, policy uh, make, uh, making, the gap is going to get, become narrower and narrower over, over time. You know, Chinese income per capita may never catch up with the U.S., but because of a much larger population, Chinese GDP can catch up with that of the U.S. or even surpass that of the U.S. with very high probability. And that's something that the U.S. is not used to. It, right? so, so I think uh, you know, that's, a, that, that's a, in a way a bigger challenge, new, newer challenge, a bigger challenge for, for U.S. to, uh, to um, uh, manage. And I think uh, uh, you know, that certainly there's a lot of uh, uh, risk. You know, a lot of people are arguing. Uh, so, so here's the danger that, I, that I'm seeing. There are many um, people, there's a narrative in each country that regards the other country uh, is an enemy and is doing all its best to undermine, you know, this country's workers, firms, uh, and way way of living. But whether that's true or not, the, the, the problem is that that kind of you know, they are interest group in each country. Uh, they will they like this kind of narrative. The narrative is, is good for uh, these interest groups, uh, uh, you know, relative uh, influence uh, in the society. The danger is that uh, uh, you know we can have a self-fulfilling expectation that if, you, if, if, if one makes the worst possible assumption about the other side, and this becomes self-fulfilling that you you can move towards sort of a, a less and less productive, less less and productive in, in, uh, relationship. Uh, hopefully, uh, there will be in, uh, uh, you know leaders who are. Brave, brave and wise to see importance of collaboration uh, and find the uh, uh, common areas to work together. So they can, you know, we mentioned, you know, from finding cues and vaccines to the pandemic, all the way to managing uh, global climate change. Uh, we need, uh, we need the more collaboration. Well, thank you, Professor Shang Jinwei. Uh, this uh, a link to this recording will be sent out to registrants for the for the uh, event. Uh, on behalf of the Chazen Institutes for, for Global Business and uh, the Initiative for Economic Policy, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for the excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you.